Hello everybody, Tank Type 1 here. Today we have another amazing episode of cheese making here in the Type 1 kitchen. Today we're we'll making halloumi cheese. Um, and you might be wondering, Justin, wait a minute, I thought I'll subscribe to a diabetic channel. What are you talking about cheese for? Let me explain. Halloumi is actually a great cheese for diabetics. Why? Because unlike almost every other cheese, halloumi will always keep its shape even when you heat it up, even when you grill it, when you fry it, when you air fry it. Basically, halloumi is a cheese that you can fry and sort of have like a cheese stick kind of thing or a grilled cheese or all sorts of different things without the bread. So for low carb advocates like myself, halloumi is actually an awesome cheese to have. And you might want to try making it yourself because guess what? You can't find it at the store. Finding halloumi in Kroger's or wherever else, not so easy. Most of the time, it's a pretty rare thing to find. So today I'm gonna to show you how I make halloumi using my raw goat's milk. And uh, let me first give you the ingredients for it. So of course you're gonna need your milk, first things first. Now, as far as milk goes, the milk I use is raw goat's milk from a local farm. Uh, raw milk in general, where it's from a goat or a cow or whatever, will work best. And if you use that, you won't need any extra cultures or anything. But of course, you can also use milk from the grocery store, just as long as, as, long as it's not ultra pasteurized. And if it is ultra pasteurized, you will need some culture like C21 buttermilk or MA4002. You can get that from a cheesemaking.com. But if you have some raw milk like I do, you can just use that. Um, although I will be adding just a little bit of this um, mesophilic culture just to add a little bit more flavor. It's not probably going to make a big difference, but I figure I might as well add it just in case. Of course, you also need some animal rennet, or any rennet for that matter. Rennet tablets, so on, paste. I like to use the liquid rennet because um, it's easy to measure out, and as long as you're quick with it, it works just fine. You need a wooden spoon as well. Some citric acid, optional for the ricotta that we can make along with the halloumi. We'll get to that in a minute. You need some salt. To finish it off, a knife to cut the curds, a thermometer to check the temperature of the cheese, that's very important, of course, a big old pot to put the milk in and heat it up. So that's the basics of what you need. This is actually a very simple recipe. It's only going to take a few hours tops, which is actually less time than most cheeses. And the first time I did this was two weeks ago, and it turned out pretty good, so let's get this going. And by the way, if you are... Um, using milk from the store, pasteurized milk, be sure to get some calcium chloride too. You need about three eighths of a table of a sorry, three eighths of a teaspoon with this recipe. If you don't have any calcium chloride, it's not gonna work because all the good stuff that's in the milk has been heated out by the pasteurization, but calcium chloride is able to um, balance up the calcium a little bit and make it so you can still make cheese. So keep that in mind as well. So I just put the milk in the pot and um what I do to heat it up, because I take it straight out of the fridge, is I simply put the burner that it's on on about a medium heat and just keep stirring it constantly so that way the heating is even, it's not burning on the bottom. And that should slowly heat it up to about where we want it to be, which is about 86 to 88 degrees Fahrenheit um, in about 10 to 15 minutes, which is fine. All right, looks like our milk is at just the right temperature. Now, I turned the heat off when it hit 80 on the thermometer because um, the I'm not taking it off the burner, I'm just leaving where it is, and the burner's heat is going to keep going up into it as it cools down. It's going to go up a little bit after you turn the heater off, so keep that in mind when you're making this. Um, now that it's up to temperature, I'm going to add a little bit of this culture to it. Just sprinkle a little bit on it. It's, it's optional, honestly. You don't need the culture but I'm just having a little bit of fun with it. And then I'm gonna add um, 3 16 of a teaspoon of this liquid rennet. Now the recipe calls for a quarter teaspoon, which is more than 3 16 if you can't do the math there. Um, but they're doing a quarter, spoon, quarter teaspoon for pasteurized milk, raw milk you can use a little rest rennet for. So I'm gonna fill that, I'm gonna use one of these little bad boys. And keep in mind if you are adding a culture to it, let it sit for a few minutes before you stir it in, so that way it has a chance to rehydrate itself. Um, let it sit there for just... The, the recipe doesn't call to have the 
the culture sit there for long because it's going to get destroyed by the higher temperatures soon anyway. But it's good to do for the ripening process. So again, culture is optional for halloumi, but it's good to have and this is what you do if you would to add it to it. Now I'm stirring the rennet in right now. You want to make sure when you're stirring the rennet in to stir for a good at least a minute, like at least a full 60 seconds. So that way it's fully incorporated. You're not going to have some parts that are coagulating and some that aren't. Make sure you give it a good minute long stir at the very least, minute or two. I always just look at the clock, see what time it is, and go either a minute or two past that. That way you will make sure that it's all going to be dispersed in the milk just fine. It's not going to be reacting a little weird. And once you're done stirring, what you want to do is you want to bring it to a stop. Bring it back a little bit. Make sure it gets still. Alright. It's looking a lot more still. You don't want it to keep spinning while it's in there. Just want to make it go to a stop. And then we're going to wait about 30 to 40 minutes for it to um, curd up. And we'll know it's ready with the test that we'll do once it's done. Now that it's been about um, 30 or so minutes, we're going to go ahead and check to see if the curd is ready to cut. And to do that, we just take our butter knife here, stick it in there and see if it splits eat, splits cleanly. So we're just gonna take this and go whoop, turn sideways, bring it back up. And as you see, it makes a nice clean split. No BS happening there. So that's good to go. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to just cut this into squares. Um, and then after a little bit, we're going to let it sit for a minute to solidify. And then we're going to cut um, lines in it. So that way, instead of being just square, you know, vertical columns, it's going to be actual cubes throughout the entire thing. You may not be able to see it very well, but um, I cut this into about 0.75 to 1.5 inch uh, squares. And now I'm going to use this knife here and you can also use a ladle or any sort of long tool to cut horizontally as well. I'm just going to spin it like this on both sides and that way there is going to be cut cubes rather than cut columns and um, after I do that then we're going to start cooking the curds by heating this pack up, heating this pot back up again. Next step now that we've cut the curds is we're going to um, put this on a sort of medium to low heat and slowly heat this curds back up and cook them. We want to get this temperature back up to about 106 degrees. Right now it's at um, where we started initially. It, it kept the temperature pretty well, 87.8. We want to get this up to 106 degrees, but we want to do it slowly. We want it to take about 20 to 30 minutes to get there. And once we do, we're going to keep it at that temperature and cook it for another 20 to 30 minutes. And what that's going to do is going to get a lot of the whey out. It's going to make a more consolidated curd. And this is going to make it easier for next step, which is we're going to be cooking it more in the way that it drops off here. So you're going to just want to stir gently. And it's okay. Um... If curds start falling, if curds start breaking apart a little bit here and there, you're going to have a lot of broken up curds by the end of this. You don't want to go too fast, obviously, because you don't want to, you know, wreck it. But you do want to stir consistently as this thing is heating up. Otherwise, you're going to have burnt curds on the bottom and uncooked curds on the top. So make sure you're stirring this and just give it a good, slow, gentle stir for about 20 to 30 minutes until this heats up to 106 degrees. So... Medium low ended up being just a little too hot. Um, they ended up heating up a little faster than I expected. It took about 10 minutes rather than 20. But it's okay. I'll just cook it for a little longer at 30 minutes rather than 20. And it should you know, even out to about 40 minutes total. You'll notice as you're stirring it and as it gets hotter that it'll start to clump together like that. Be sure to just break them apart and keep stirring as you go. And just keep that, you know, smooth stirring going for another 30 minutes or so. 20-30 minutes to cook those curds and once you do then we'll drain the curds and we'll put the whey into a separate stock pot and we'll use that whey to make ricotta and then use that whey to heat the halloumi for the final step. We'll get to that in a moment. 
All right, so these curds have been cooking in this 106 degree way for about 30 minutes. And we didn't have to stir it continuously. We just had to, you know, stir it every three to five minutes for that period of time. Once you turn the heat off, of course. Once the heat's off, you can stir it less frequently. Um, but now that that's done, I gotta admit something. I lied to you. There's actually a few more things you need. First, you need another pot that you're going to use to drain the whey into and leave just the curds. So we gotta separate the two. You're going to need a colander for this purpose as well. The, if you can get something bigger than this, more power to you. This is all I got. And we're going to need some molds that the cheese is going to be draining in. You can find these from cheesemaking.com. That's where I get mine or from lots of other stores online. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to put this colander on here like that. It fits nice and easy. And we're basically going to carefully pour the whey into here and do it slowly. We don't want to do it too fast because we don't want the whey to be caught up with all the curd. We want most of the whey in here, then the curd, then the rest of the whey in. And that way it's not going to overflow this thing because this is just not a very big colander for this job, unfortunately. I get a lot of curd mass from the goat milk especially. So that's how it is. But we'll go ahead and do that and we'll get back to you in a moment. All right, now we got the curds in the colander. We're going to put that into the mold and we're going to clean out this stock pot that the cheese was in because we're going to use it later. We already have most of the whey drained out in here and we're going to just heat this back up in a minute, but let's first get these in the uh, molds. All right, so we have our curds here. I'm going to use two drain molds rather than just one because I don't want to overfill it. And once we just scoop them in here with our hands, we're just going to press down on it, try to consolidate them a little bit. And then just to add a little weight, what we're going to do is we're going to stack one on top of the other on this um, little grid. And that way it's got a little room to drain. I have it in this sheet pan to drain in. So that way the whey doesn't go over the place. This way we're just going to throw out because the sheet pan's dirty, but we're just going to press this in like so. Try to consolidate up a little bit, get a little bit of form. And what we're going to do is we're going to let this um, sit on top of this other one for about 15 minutes. And then we're going to take each of these curds out, flip them over and put so the, and flip the curds over so that the other sides on the bottom of each mold and also switch the mold so that the top mold is on the bottom. So that way both curds will get a good pressing down. And um, you they, they're pretty separate right now, but you know, these curds are still pretty warm and it's, it's going to consolidate. So just give it a little bit of time. It will consolidate enough to where you can easily flip it. Just be careful with it, especially right now. It'll be a little easier after the first flip. Of course, while this is over here draining. We're going to heat this bad boy up to high temperatures. We're going to slowly heat this up to about 195 degrees for two reasons. One, you need to be 195 degrees to make whey ricotta. We have whey here. We're going to make ricotta cheese with it. Bonus, we get some ricotta cheese out of this. And two, we have to heat this way up anyways because we already cooked the curds a little bit, sure, but we also have to cook the curds again once they're in their forms in a 195 degree way in order to give them that solid structure that halloumi is famous for. If you do not cook the cheese in this hot way when it gets nice and hot, it's not going to be halloumi. It's not going to hold together under pressure, all right? We've got to give it the heat first. So we're going to heat this up to 195. You might be asking yourself, Justin, why not just heat anything to 195? Why not just get a pot of water up to 195? Well, you want to use whey because whey has already got the same levels of calcium, the same pH. All the stuff that the cheese has, the whey is very similar in. And, that, and this is important because if you just use water, what's in the cheese is going to end up leaking out into the water because it's not balanced. But the way it is balanced. So, especially since you're gonna have the cheese sitting there for about 30 minutes when you're cooking it, you wanna make sure everything is balanced. That's why we gotta use the whey from this cheese. So we're gonna get this heated up to 195. 
And then we're going to make some whey ricotta. And after that, we're going to use this hot whey to heat this cheese up. All right. So we have our ricotta here. we got the heat on. Currently, we are at 120. Again, we got a little time to spare, so we're going to slowly heat this up. We're going to make ricotta by first waiting until it gets to about 150 degrees according to the thermometer. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add one eighth of a teaspoon of the citric acid. Remember this stuff? We're going to add a little bit of that to that, and that acid is going to curdle the way we make the ricotta, basically. Now at 165 to 170, we're going to add a teaspoon of salt. And if you have any extra milk, feel free to add some of that too, because that will increase the yield of the ricotta. I'm going to use the leftover milk in the gallon of raw milk we had here. There's just a little bit left, maybe about a tablespoon. We're going to throw that in there, and that will increase the yield a little bit. But you can put it up to a whole pint if you want. Now will get you a lot of nice, rich ricotta. Okay, we added the uh, salt in and the little bit of milk we have left. We're almost at 175 now. At about 185 to 195, um, stop stirring. We're going to stop stirring this. We're going to turn the heat off and just let the whey, uh, let the ricotta rise up to the top. You know, cream always rises to the top, as a famous man once said. We're going to let the ricotta rise to the top, and then we're just going to skim it off. I'm going to use um, this cheese ladle right here. Again, cheesemaking.com for that. They're, they don't sponsor me, I promise. I just They're just a useful site, okay? And I'm going to skim it off and basically just scoop it out, put it in a jar, and uh, then we'll mix some salt in that, okay? And by the way, I um, decided to put a little follower and a bottle on top of the... Um, cheese molds just to add a little bit more weight to it just so it can sour a little bit more you can try it yourself if you like some sort of bottle add a little bit more weight about one or two pounds is all you need all right got my ricotta in this big old jar now it was a little bit more than i thought the smaller jar was too small i got a lot of ricotta out of that now if you don't have a cheese skimmer like this you can also just use one of these strainers and that can do the job as well but now we got our whey without the ricotta in it. Still need that. Keep it in mind, don't get it, don't throw it away just yet. We're gonna heat this whey back up to 195 degrees. And once it's up there, we gotta keep it up there while we cook these cheeses here. I've already flipped them, that's why they're nice and solid and consolidated like this. Not perfectly consolidated, still got plenty of cracks, that's fine. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take these out of this mold and slowly lower them into the hot way once it's at about 190 to 195. And we're going to cook these two discs in the way for about 30 minutes or so. And once they're flowing to the top, after about 30 minutes, they should be ready to go. They should be fully cooked. And this is going to harden the structure and make it so that they're grillable, friable, they're going to keep them shaped no matter, no matter what you do to them, no matter how much you heat them up, okay? Just going to carefully lower this thing in. We don't want to get it on the bomb too quick because it'll stick. It'll burn the bottom. If you drop it in there, you're going to get hot oil over your face, and that would be no good. Just slowly in like that. Do the same thing with the next one. And if you like, you can take this ricotta, add just a little bit more salt. Not much more, just a little bit more to taste. Mix it up with a spoon, and I just add just enough to where it is amazing. Mmm, good stuff. Yeah, that's a good treat to have along with the halloumi. You're going to, I got, think I got about half a pound of this stuff here, just from that, just from that one gallon of milk. And plus, I get all the cheese too. I get all the halloumi along with it. Big benefits. All right, final step. We're going to just hand press these down into nice fine discs and put some salt on it. You wanna use about half an ounce of salt, about 3% of the weight of the cheese. Should be about a pound or so. Um, and once you salt just one side of each of these discs with the half of an ounce of salt, um, the recipe says you can just fold it over kind of like a taco. Well, I'm, what you could do is you could cut it into slices and just stuff it in Tupperware from there. Or 
have it in the disc or fold it, however you want to do it. Um, you can also just cut it up into slices later and cook that up your however you'd like. I'll give you some examples of what I cook it myself, but we'll go ahead and get the rest of this done while it's still hot. And be sure when you salt these, use like a more coarse grain salt. I got some rock salt, like Himalayan pink salt here. You can use some cheese salt or you can use some uh, pickling salt, some sea salt, kosher salt. You want to use like, don't, don't use the fine table salt for this. Be a lot better off using real good salt. I saw what I'm going to do is I'm going to slice these into pieces, maybe strips and cut them in half or three ways. That way it would be easier for me to portion out. Um, I don't like having too much cheese at once because if I have too much cheese at once, it affects my blood sugar longer after I eat in a negative way. It's kind of unpredictable in that sense. So I try to keep it light per meal. I don't try to eat too much cheese at once. Although, especially after cooking this halloumi, it's very tempting. You'll see in a minute. Um, but I'm going to put this in the strips and already have it in pieces so that way it's less heavy than we just chomp down an entire one of these discs, you know what I'm saying? Alright guys, it's been about two days since I made the cheese. I like to let it in the fridge for a couple days just so it can age a little bit and get a little bit of flavor. The recipe calls for three to five, but I honestly can't wait. So now, just to show how well this works, we're going to fry some in a pan and grill some. We're going to grill some first because it's already getting dark out. Um, just to show you that it works, that you really can grill this cheese without falling apart like any other cheese out there. It's brilliant. It's great. You can basically have grilled cheese, literally, without the bread. Huh. Pretty neat. We'll show you how it's done. Here's the cheese. I already sliced it into slices, like I said I was going to do. Now, of course, if you're grilling it, you might not want to slice it as much as I did. You might want to have some bigger pieces, just because... You don't want any to slide between the grates, but we're going to find the bigger slices in here and use that on the grill, and we'll take the smaller ones and fry them up in a pan, okay? All right, so we got some of the cheese strips in the grill here. Let's go ahead and flip them over. So far, they're doing pretty good. Look at that grill, Mark. Ooh, baby. That one's looking good, too. They're getting a little floppy, but otherwise, they're staying pretty nice. Most cheeses, you put them on a grill, they would melt. They'd be already melted through by now. Alright, so here's the end result for the grilled pieces. As you can see, they didn't fall through. Still pretty solid. Got some nice grill marks. Already ate a little bit of it. Look at those nice grill eyes. Look how nice and floppy it is. Still held on its own pretty well, even if it's even in the smaller strips in the grill. Let's go ahead and give it a try. That is amazing. It really does remind me of a grilled cheese sandwich. Like, there's just the flavor of it. So sort of the buttery, soft texture. Now this doesn't really um, stretch like mozzarella cheese does for sure, but it's still ooey gooey delicious. Mm. Dude, I gotta be careful with this stuff. I'm gonna overdo it. All right, so we're gonna fry up a little bit more in this pan here, just so you can really see um, how unique this cheese is compared to the cheeses. Now when you fry your pan, I like to use just a little bit of butter. Not much because the cheese isn't going to soak any of it up, but you know, throw it in there just to make sure, just a, a, a layer of oil just to make sure it doesn't stick to the pan, right? It might not either way, because this halloumi doesn't really stick, but nonetheless, it adds a little bit more butter flavor. Hey, you know, I'm a bit of a fiend when it comes to butter, so we're going to add it to it, okay? Now, I had it on a medium heat, but we're going to turn this down to about medium, between medium low and medium. So that way, it, the cheese doesn't cook too much on one side before um, it cooks on the inside, okay? So I'm gonna mix this in there, add the cheese in, and I'll see you in just a moment. All right, so I got it in the pan, flipped it over, and just look how beautiful this cheese is. Now, like I said, I try to do it on a medium low heat. You don't want it to burn too fast on one side. I had them cook until they're soft on the top and then I flipped them so that way they're going to be cooked thoroughly. You want that cheese nice and melt in your mouth, you know. You don't want it to be too solid in the middle. Now, notice that it doesn't stick. You know, I did all the flipping and the cheese is very close to each other and yet they all move freely. They don't stick to each other. They hold their shape. It's, it is literally as rigid as a breaded cheese stick is, you know. 
I've seen a lot of recipes for keto cheese sticks where it's pork rinds and eggs and all this stuff. That's all for the birds, okay? All you need is some halloumi. And you've got all the fried cheese you want and you don't need any extra ingredients. Just cheese. This this is incredible stuff, people. I'm telling you. And just to, just to remind you, I am not planning to eat all this. I already ate too much cheese from the grill. Um, I'm going to save most of this, portion it out for later, uh, because... Um, I don't like to cook that often. I'm not going to cook for every single meal. Um, but cheese, this cheese is definitely much tastier after you get a good sear on it. So be sure to cook, cook this cheese before you eat it. Otherwise, you're not going to get the full halloumi experience. And um, keep in mind, by the way, if you have kids and you're, you're feeding this to your kids and you have leftovers, hide them. Hide them far away where no one can get it because... The minute these, your kid's going to try one of these, they're going to keep chomping down until they're all gone. These are amazing. Seriously, watch out. Be careful. Alright, this cheese is all ready. Let's go ahead and give one a bite here. Look at that beauty. Bon Appetit. Mmm. Damn, that felt good. That is so, so good. Be really careful with this cheese. You, you, it's so easy to overdo it. I've already gone over my limit today. I got so much more cheese on this plate that I could eat, but I gotta save all the rest of it or else my blood sugar's gonna be, you know, going high later and later in the night from all the cheese digestion in my system. So, yeah, this stuff is amazing. It works really, really well. Um, a few things I'll add about this cheese, some final tips is, first, storage. Um, this is meant to be a fresh cheese. Now you can age it for a few days like I said. You can probably keep it in the fridge for up to two weeks or so. That's what I've done. That's how long it would last me at least. But, you know, past that, I would not try to, I would not be, I would not be indulging much in this cheese. Um, of course it won't last that long anyway, right? But let's say you make a ton of cheese and you want to save some of it. You can always store the cheese in the freezer. Get yourself an airtight um, vacuum seal pack. Just store the whole thing in one big piece in the freezer. That can do just fine. You just gotta thaw it out and it should be good as new by the time you thaw it out whenever you need it. Um, and yeah, like I said, you want to cook this cheese before you eat it because that's really giving the full character of halloumi, giving the real, the full flavor sensation. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope this helps you find a amazing new cheese snack to give to yourself or to your diabetic children. Um, if you'd like to see more cheese content, I'll probably be making some Parmesan next week. If you'd like to see more, let me know in the comments below. Be sure to like, subscribe, share it around with any other diabetics you know who want to learn how to make some cool, friable cheese. And until then, keep him at type 1. I'll see y'all next time.